Welcome to Viewpoints. I'm Heather Isvron, and with me today is Carol Lucas, Senior Planner with the Department of Homeland Security, working in the area of biometric identity. Welcome, Carol. Hello, Heather. So first, let's talk about you. How did you get into this very dynamic and emerging field? Well, I'm an engineer by trade um, and have a lot of experience with project management, uh, process refinement, and I was fortunate to find a um, position within the Office of Biometric Identity Management where they wanted to build on those planning skills and decision analysis skills. For those of us who don't know, uh, biometrics is such a big field. Let's start with a definition. What is a biometric? Well, in the context of Homeland Security uh, and Defense, a biometric is a physical characteristic unique to an individual um, that can be used either alone or in combination to uh, advance automated recognition. You're probably most familiar with fingerprints, uh, but there are other biometrics that are in the research and development arena um, for operational use. That includes uh, facial recognition, iris, vein prints, um, palms, even, even earlobes. Oh, really? It's fascinating. I have the clear, you know, when I go on airplanes, and that takes the iris and the fingers. Correct. So, so, so there's an example of an application of, of biometrics. Um, in order to use biometrics for automated recognition, they have to be converted to a template um, using mathematical algorithms. Um, and this is part of the work that's done in the research and development arena. Um, those templates then are stored in a database and they can be used for searching and for matching. And how does, you know, our audience would like to know, how does the Department of Homeland Security use that information? There are many applications. Uh, my work in the Office of Biometric Identity Management, we maintain the largest gallery of biometric information in the government. Um, we have over 250 million unique identities. And when I, I refer to identities, it's not the, the typical name and address that we, we think of. Um, it is the biometric identities based around the, the unique biometrics. We perform over 100,000 matches, uh, transactions per day for our uh, operational components like Customs and Border Protection, Transportation Security Administration, um, as well as partners uh, in the international arena, uh, State Department and Department of Justice. So an example, for instance, um, if a non-citizen applies for a visa through the State Department, they will run those biometrics uh, through our database, and that will allow them to answer the question, have they seen this person before? Have they applied for a visa recently and been turned down perhaps, or are they linked to any law enforcement activity? So it makes the whole process much more efficient and accurate. It does, and enables the frontline decision makers to make a decision about the person that's presenting themselves either for access, for admittance across the border, or for uh, citizenship benefit. Mm. Tell us how the verification process works. Well, with uh, automated recognition of the biometrics, um, you essentially do one of two things. You, you can verify that the person is who they say they are, or you can identify and really find out who they, who they are. Um, so let's talk a little bit about verification. Verification is usually done in a situation where you're, you're pretty confident that you know the, the pool of individuals that are gonna be presented. You're confident that you, for the most part, you have seen them before. And we, we talk about that in terms of searching from one to little n. So there's some very specific- Wait, I'm sorry, can you back up? What's one to little n? <laughs> one to little n, little n is a, a limited population. Mm. You're not searching against the entire database, you're searching against a limited um, group within okay. the, the database. Identification is much more challenging um, because you're now trying to figure out who who is this person. They may present with the name, and, and a piece of paper, but you're trying to figure out who, who they really are. So where have you seen them before? Are they connected with any derogatory information? And, and by the way, um, the database that we manage in the services provide that information to the uh, operational components, and they're the ones that make the decision on what to do about the individual, um, whether or not they, they want to grant access or admission. And when we talk about identification, we're talking about one to big N. Mm -hmm. And this provides a whole new uh, realm of expertise required because you're really talking big data now. 
So you bring in expertise from um, system architecture experts, uh, privacy law experts. You have to look at interoperability and you look at, at business roles. Um, how do you manage your searches uh, within your large database? And it's such a big field. I mean, when you're talking about it at the kind of upper levels of research and development, what are the things that surprise you the most that, that you found so far in terms of the research? I think what we're learning is that each of the biometric types, um, and by the way, we also call them modalities. Um, so each of those modalities has a strength, has a particular application that they're suited for. Um, so what we really need to do is look at how do we combine them, use them in combination to provide information to the frontline decision makers. So there is no silver bullet, um, and it's about understanding the strengths and weaknesses of each biometric and improving the, the algorithms, the research and development around the mathematical algorithms that allow us to match. As we look at the research of this emerging field on the evolution scale, how far are we to using this every day in every city, town, and in our government? I would say on a scale of one to 10, we're at about a three. Um, and there are so many exciting things um, that lay ahead for us. So I've talked a little bit about applications for um, safety and security on a national basis. But think for a moment for, uh, in terms of first responders. Uh, suppose you have a citizen who is out jogging and for whatever reason had a medical emergency, uh, was unconscious. Wouldn't it be wonderful if those first responders could um, take a fingerprint and through previously established um, options by that individual, they now have access to the medical records, uh, are there allergies, they have records to family members and emergency contacts, uh, all within a matter of seconds. Those are some of the things that we really can look forward to and can think about. Very important, however, this uh, topic of opting in and I would encourage leaders at all levels to really look at opting in as an opportunity for um, public education and literacy around technology like biometrics. The biometric technology can enable so many services to citizens and improve quality of life, but it's so important that we educate and share information on the pros and cons and the trade-offs. Tell us some of the hurdles that you've encountered as you look at the privacy issues surrounding biometric identity. Privacy is so important. Some of the things we do at the federal level to ensure that um, we preserve the privacy and that people have control over their, their information and that they can be assured that it's used wisely includes um, systems that manage biometric data, um, whether a repository or they, they use it for matching, uh, required to do a statement of records notice uh, through the privacy community that's reviewed uh, also with legal expertise repositories of data, uh, types of data, for instance, when we um, ingest for have information from the Department of Justice or from the Department of Defense. All of those efforts require a privacy threshold analysis and a privacy impact statement. So there are a lot of uh, eyes on and a lot of checks and balances in how the data is managed and stored and the follow-up to ensure that is uh, that we manage it the way that we said we would. And I think it's so important though to, to flip and perhaps reframe this discussion of privacy, not from a requirement, but for as an enabler. We know in terms of timelines and bringing uh, a new modality uh, to market or at least making it ready for our, our government customers, the technology and the research and development are probably the speediest parts. Working through privacy is one of the most deliberate aspects of it. So part of our challenge in the government is to preposition start earlier, uh, address the privacy, open, free and open discovery, and get some feedback on how we're going to manage these assets before we even dig into the technology. Yeah, I think the transparency is so important. Absolutely. As we think about this in, in the big picture kind of scheme of things, you're on this level three of level 10 research. What do you envision for how we can better make our population knowledgeable and educated about the future of biometrics. To build on some of the things that we've learned here uh, at the Center for Homeland Defense and Security, I think it's important for leaders at all levels to prepare the workforce to collaborate uh, in new ways across 
traditional boundaries. Uh, and sometimes that means developing new skills or additional skills beyond you know, superb project management and, and system oversight. For instance, managing polarities, um, shifting away from thinking of either or, right and wrong, you know, you, you guys are good, you guys are bad, and figuring out how do you balance the priorities for, for the different groups uh, and the different entities involved. Um, and this includes collaboration across government, uh, state, local, federal, but also with academia, collaboration with industry. And we shouldn't forget the, the nonprofit world. Mm. Uh, there are a lot of advocacy groups that bring a perspective and a core of information to the topic. And how do you work with them now? In the federal government, um, some very formal working groups, well-defined with charters. And I would like to see that expand, um, and I would like to see more res resources put into that and more emphasis at the different levels of government. So what advice do you have for local state governments, first responders that you work with? In addition to really focusing on collaboration is um, shifting the mindset to expand from um, dealing with com complicated issues where we're, we're trying to solve problems and also figuring out how to reframe things uh, and leverage opportunities. Final what does that look like though? Can you give me an example? I would say rather than, um, for instance, as a strategic planner, I, I have the privilege of facilitating uh, framing the discussion around some of our future activities. So rather than asking the question, what's wrong, what do we need to fix, which is important to look at, but also ask, what do we do really well? And what do our customers need? And that, that opens the door to innovation. And yes, it is possible to innovate uh, In without government. the government. <laughs> yeah. Good. Well, are there any other things that uh, our folks should know when they're looking at the future of biometric identity? There are so many potential applications um, and I'd ask you to think in terms of certainly safety and security of the nation, but also think in terms of services to our citizens, uh, providing quicker, better, more accurate access, and also think about quality of life and how exciting it is for all of us to be on the forefront. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Carol. Thanks, Heather. Mm -hmm.